there's nothing in the world that makes me happier than this, by the way. The fact that I can fill my boots for long periods of time with very little competition uh, around assets that seemingly to me have absolutely no downside except perhaps political risk and tenfold upside. So I, I really like that theme. The other thing I like is... Rick, how you doing? Life is good, thank you. The better for being on with you. Thanks so much for coming on. We're about halfway done through the year. I should say we are halfway done through the year. And um, I want to get your thoughts on where we've come through this year. What are you looking at towards the end of the year, by the end of the year, and going on into 25? What are your thoughts? Well, it's been a pretty easy year, uh, particularly given the years that came before it. There is a time to write checks, which is when nobody else is doing it. And there's a time to cash checks, which is when everybody else is writing them. So certainly the first part of this year, like the last half of last year, in as an example, the uranium juniors uh, or any place that was hot, uh, I was beginning to cash checks. Uh, in most of the rest of the portfolio, I'm still writing checks. It, it seems to me right now we're in a sweet spot. The commodities have moved. The interest is around the stocks, but a lot of people haven't pulled the trigger yet for fairly understandable reasons. As an example, the gold has moved because of central bank buying, and the central banks don't buy gold stocks. So the dichotomy between the move in gold and the lack of move in the gold stocks is fairly obvious. History teaches us that after uh, gold is established, the physical gold has established the uptrend, that eventually the gold stocks follow. So when I say we're in a sweet spot, uh, I, I really truly think we're in a sweet spot. The condition precedent for the gold stocks to move has already occurred, and the gold stocks haven't moved yet. There is a skepticism in the market uh, because of the tepid response of the gold stocks, which keeps other people from competing with knowledgeable speculators such as myself. This feels to me just like as good as it can possibly get. I need to say that when I talk optimistically, uh, I, I stick to the proposition that I made the last time you, you uh, interviewed me, which is to say that uh, if you look at the length and breadth of the junior market, probably 80% of them are valueless. So you can't invest in the sector, but probably 5% of the companies generate so much performance that they add legitimacy and luster to uh, a sector where 80% of the participants are valueless. And it is that 5 to 20% that I'm talking about. Uh, when they say that there's no financing available for juniors, that's hokum. Uh, most of the juniors aren't financeable. Uh, I have participated, I think, in about 20 financings in the last 24 months. Uh, and uh, at least 15 of them were oversubscribed, meaning despite the fact that I'm a, high, a fairly high-profile investor, somebody who companies like to have on their roster, I got cut back uh, on my subscription. That doesn't seem to me to be a capital short market. But that, mis that notwithstanding, uh, I think there are very, very good companies available for very fair prices. Uh, and that's a wonderful circumstance. Uh, and I use gold as an illustration, but Clearly, as an example, the copper thesis that we would have talked about on your show in 2022, had we talked, has played out. <laughs> um, you know, we talked about the fact that at $20 a pound, it had to go up to a market clearing price. It had to go up to the price where producers earned their cost of capital. And guess what? It did. We talked about the fact that uh, the COVID depressed levels of oil and gas pricing had to increase when people began to travel again because the oil industry didn't earn its cost of capital and frankly couldn't pay their taxes at prior at prior prices well it did uh and the markets uh have responded so i, I mean i i would say that we're with regards to uh mining equities uh, and mining private placement debt that we're in one of those truly 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 lovely circumstances uh, I'm not going to say that we won't have a recession. Uh, and if we have a recession, that bull market's going to be derailed for two or three years. I'm not smart enough to tell you that we are or we aren't. 
uh, I am smart enough or rather old enough to tell you that we will come out the backside of a recession. Uh, it's odd that at 71 years of age, I have more patience than most of your younger listeners, but experience has given me that. Uh, and we will come out of the backside of that recession. I'm also not saying that there isn't some sort of black swan event which could cause a liquidity squeeze, a 2008-style liquidity squeeze, and take all equity markets down 50%. That's something that could happen. It seems to happen every 10 or 15 years, whether we need it or not. What I'm saying is that if you look at the probabilities of all the circumstances in front of us, uh, the probability of supply shortages within five years in industrial materials like oil and copper, the probability of higher precious metals prices as a consequence of the deterioration in purchasing power offered up by fiat-denominated uh, savings products, uh, and the fact that equity valuations are measured against commodity prices and historical norms attractive means that we are in a wonderful circumstance right now as investors. The circumstance which we enjoyed in the first six months of this year, anybody who didn't enjoy it wasn't a knowledgeable player, uh, will continue. Uh, the gratification which was inevitable is now imminent. <laughs> and that's just a wonderful circumstance. Well, about that, I find myself as an investor and somebody who has skin in the game as well as an incredible amount of interest in this, I find myself almost afraid because I'm too optimistic, if that makes sense. <laughs> because like you've said, it's a sweet spot. And I just, it's, I'm rare, rarely in a sweet spot, if that makes sense. It's been a long time since the valuations were reasonable, but the catalysts were in place. Yes. Uh, I think the fact that you look at this circumstance and you're still cautious means you're likely to make money. Uh, there are a lot of people who will draw solace from the fact that on news stocks are going up as opposed to sideways these days and become incautious. Uh, if you become incautious in this sector, you become poor and you do it very rapidly. So I would suggest to people that they remember the admonishment at the beginning of this interview, which was uh, out of a population of 3,000 juniors worldwide, at least 80% are valueless. If you pay a penny a share for them, you're overpaying. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't go up in price. <laughs> It means that if you juxtapose the price to value, you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk. I would also, Andy, uh, further to that discussion of caution, uh, tell your listeners that one of the things that I've seen is that most people own way too many stocks. As you probably know, I've graded 80,000 investor portfolios over the last 10 years. Might include it. I've learned probably more than I've taught. And one of the things I've learned is that many speculators own way too many companies. I have told people in the rural classroom that I believe that the number of companies that they should own in their portfolio corresponds exactly to the number of hours per month they, they plan to work. Uh, I think you need to allocate a minimum of one hour per company per month. Reading the filing statements, reading the annual report, reading the proxy, not listening to podcasts. That comes under the heading general education, not specific education. So if you can afford or stand or like to spend 10 hours a month, then you can own 10 juniors. If you can afford 20 hours per month, then you can afford 20 juniors. But I see portfolios where people who have lives, they have kids, they have jobs, they have stuff like that. And then they have 65 or 70 companies in their portfolio. It's impossible that they can follow that many companies. Yeah, that's great advice, especially you got to do the work. You got to just, like anything, you just really have to do the work, put in the effort. Um, we talked about, last time we talked, we talked a lot about silver. We've always talked about gold. We've talked uh, some about uranium. What I want to know now is what are you seeing that's as a commodity class, asset class, what do you see that you're interested in and is possibly 
uh, undervalued or underinvested in right now going, yeah, going on right now? Two things. Uh, tier one projects that are juniors, uh, which is to say projects that have the hallmarks of having a minimum of $10 billion in in situ recoverable reserves that would be in the bottom cost quartile worldwide and the top quartile in terms of return on capital employed, but at least 25%. Uh, if those projects aren't in glamour materials, they are stupidly cheap, really, truly stupidly cheap. Uh, there are projects that look like they could develop into generational assets that are trading at below 20% of indicated NAV. These are projects that, if the drilling continues as it has happened so far, will be sold to major mining companies. And they will be sold to major mining companies for 10-figure sums. So. The fact that the exploration project process, the delineation process, the PFS process is boring uh, means that people have sold off these high quality assets uh, in favor of frankly shitty assets that have more near term momentum. There's nothing in the world that makes me happier than this, by the way. The fact that I can fill my boots for long periods of time with very little competition uh, around assets that seemingly to me have absolutely no downside except perhaps political risk and tenfold upside. So I, I really like that theme. The other thing I like is grassroots exploration with high quality teams, really high quality teams. Intellectual capital uh, is on sale here. I just interviewed somebody who will remain nameless because I haven't bought my stock yet. Uh, with a market capitalization of about two million Canadian dollars, with a million two uh, in the till, tiny company, uh, and a veteran exploration team who have been active uh, in a country that I like for 40 years. Uh, they've been responsible for six or seven economic discoveries. Now, the fact that they've been successful before, before doesn't guarantee that they're going to be successful this time. But some of the past successes uh, have been sold for, you know, nine-figure sums. Uh, these people have spent their whole careers within 200 kilometers of where they're exploring today. The two properties in the company, $1.2 in cash with a $2 million market capitalization valuation. This agglomeration of intellectual capital uh, were this a different type of market, would have a $10 million pre-money mar pre uh, market capitalization. So I'm, I, I'm pretty attracted to that. And then something that we're going to talk about later in this interview, um, the higher quality third tier royalty companies uh, have sold off in price uniformly uh, because they bore people. Uh, free cash flow is not a boring topic. And you have some of these companies which have one form or another of definable competitive advantage uh, over their peers, uh, and there are several types of that, that have reasonable um, <clears throat> asset spreads, uh, reasonable cash generation now with the probability or in some cases the certainty of increased cash flow from projects that are under construction. There's two things that happen here. Uh, either the share prices go up or the larger royalty companies with higher share prices and lower cost of capital acquire them. Those are the only two things. It reminds me of the old Pure Later oil filter commercial, you know, where the mechanic holds up the oil filter, says, you can pay me now, or he points to a blown engine, says, you can pay me later. Either's okay with me. Uh, so so uh, I'm attracted to that. And then finally, uh, I'm attracted to the behemoths. Uh, I'm attracted to ExxonMobil. Uh, I'm attracted to BHP. Uh, because I can handle political risk, I'm attracted to Glencore. The interest around uh, Anglo-American tells you that these great big companies uh, are selling for below the value of the sum of the parts. And uh, if you believe, as an example, as I do, that over five years, a higher copper price is inevitable, 
the best way to play the game uh, is with a company that has a whole bunch of copper. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't have to permit these mines. You don't have to finance these mines. Uh, all you have to do if you have a 30 or 40 year, you know, a generational ore body is mine it uh, and sell it into a rising market. If you have uh, an existing project pipeline, you don't have to go face it. And while you're waiting for these wonderful things to happen over five years, uh, you get paid very attractive dividends. Mm. So the time value of money uh, between now and the supposed catalytic event is negative because you're getting paid a good dividend. So I'm attracted to that too. It's funny you mentioned that. I got my uh, dear old mother who's going to listen to this later, and she's a fan of yours, Rick. <laughs> she had good taste. <laughs> uh, I got her into some of the big players. I told her to buy BHP, which she did. And I said, it's hard to beat that dividend. And uh, I explained to her what the assets they had as best as I know. And the price is like, it's very hard, if not impossible, to lose money in this. Well, it's always possible, but it's very hard to lose money in this. And that's investments I like. Um, so you, we brought up royalties. And I emailed you, I want to say I emailed you, or we talked about it briefly last time. Um, I'm very attracted to royalties. Tell me why, again, you're very attractive to them about, specifically about the business model. Go in a little depth about that. And then let's talk about some specific royalty companies. Um, well, they, like, the attraction is that it's a financial rather than an operating interest in our body. Uh, when there's a capital expenditure, if you're a royalty company, you don't get a bill. Everybody else gets a bill, but you don't get a bill. Operating expense. When they're passing out operating expenditure bills, you don't get one. When the price of diesel goes up or the price of steel for steel balls in a ball mill goes up or wages go up, it doesn't matter to you. Your gross is your net. Uh, so it's by nature a very, very, very high margin business. If the royalty is on a big deposit rather than a small deposit, there is also incredible upside optionality. In my experience, all surprise, all deposits have surprises. Small deposits usually have bad surprises. And they don't have long enough mine lives to come back from those bad surprises. Big deposits have good surprises. And so you look as an example at Franco, Nevada. Uh, their Northern Nevada operations, they've received well over a billion dollars in royalty payments over 30 years right. <laughs> for a $2 million initial investment. That's crazy. And their gold reserve associated with the royalty has not depleted. Think about that. Think about that. Yeah. Now, that's an amazing, that's the best possible example that one could pull in the world. Okay, so it's an outlier. But it, it, it tells you something uh, about the exploration optionality involved in these companies. I have constructed uh, for one family office a, a natural resource portfolio that is entirely royalty and streaming companies. When I took them through the various opportunities available to them in natural resources, and, and I said that the only thing above raw commodity that gave you uh, – commodity price participation without operating risk was royalties. They said, how much of a natural resource portfolio uh, spanning market cap and spanning companies could you con con construct using royalty and streaming companies? I said, well, conceivably 100% if you were willing to have me leave out refining and marketing um, in the oil and gas business. And we were able to do that. Yeah. There's a lot to be said. For the right investor and speculator, uh, considering uh, utilizing royalty and streaming companies for the entirety of their natural resource portfolio, you won't get as much upside in a raging bull market. Uh, ironically, because very high margin companies like royalty companies have a less percentage increase in their margin from increasing prices than less efficient companies. You know, if you're a gold producer and you're making the stuff for 2,200 bucks an ounce and selling it for 2,300 bucks an ounce, and the gold price goes to 2,400 bucks an ounce, uh, your margin uh, increased, well, it doubled. Uh, if you're Franco Nevada uh, and your margin right now is 90%, 96%, 
and the gold price goes up $100. <laughs> it's pleasant, but statistically, it doesn't matter. So ironically, in a rip-roaring bull market, uh, the lousiest companies do the best, uh, albeit with risk that's unacceptable for my portfolio. Right. Uh, at 71 years of age, uh, after 50 years in natural resource equity markets, one of the things I've learned from my own money is that you can take away some of my upside if you take away most of my downside. <laughs> That's what the royalty companies do. Yeah. No, they're very attractive. Um, thank you. So let's talk about some specific royalty companies again, and I try to get a diversified bunch. Um, we gold royalty company. Tell me, um, tell me about them and if you like them and, and that sort of thing. I like them a lot, primarily because the prices come down. Uh, gold royalty two and a half years ago was selling at a substantial premium to the value of the sum of the parts. Uh, and it was then a people bet or a franchise bet. But the price of gold royalty has come down now to the point where uh, the sum of the parts is available very cheaply at the same time that the management team has begun to do a very good job of beneficiating the underlying assets. So at, at once, you don't have to play the time game because time is coming to you. They used their very high share prices three or four years ago to consolidate other players in the royalty space and became bigger, which is useful. But most importantly, the price came down. So you have a more proximal, uh, nearer term realization of value with the beneficiation of their existing assets at the same time that you're paying a lot less for the whole. Uh, I'm a big Amir Adnani fan. Uh, there are times when Amir and his network are too effective at promoting stocks and they're overpriced relative to the value of the assets. And so there was a time when I was a fairly aggressive holder, or pardon me, seller of my holdings uh, in gold royalty. Uh, it was selling for a while at a 50% premium to what I thought it was worth. And I wasn't willing to pay that. Uh, at this price, uh, particularly given the process of beneficiation, it's attractive. Got it. Empress royalty. Empress royalty, I really like. Now, understand, Empress royalty is subscale. They're going to have to grow the company. Uh, it needs to be probably twice the size to be able to afford the overhead of being a public company. What I really like about Empress Royalty is that they have a durable, sustainable advantage. They are the royalty outgrowth of Endeavor Financial, which has raised and deployed about $10 billion in the resource space, which means Empress, despite its fairly small market capitalization, has proprietary access to deal flow. They generate their own royalties, primarily with smaller private companies in Latin America and Africa. But what's important is that they see royalty products that aren't subject to competitive bid. Uh, they are private pro providers of capital with a network uh, for uh, project acquisition through Endeavor. Uh, and I really like proprietary, durable competitive advantage. It's the way we built Sprott, you know, understanding niches where we had durable competitive advantages uh, over everybody else in the space. And that's what Endeavor's been able to do. Got it. Uh, two more. Uh, Vox Royalty. Tell me about them. Uh, Vox is another one that was able to assemble a, a royalty package. Uh, with the back, with the backing of some very deep-pocketed, sophisticated investors, it's another one that became that, that was selling for a substantial premium to what it was worth. But they used that premium to monetize it, which is to say, they raised and deployed capital, and they raised and deployed that capital intelligently. It's another one where the share price has come off like a boulder off a bridge, uh, and, and so it became, it became attractively priced, partly the old-fashioned way, which is to say, the price fell. Um, the fact that the price fell, in other words, the fact that the business is available more cheaply than it used to be, for some reason disturbs investors. It's weird that when investors go into a store to buy a winter coat, they want to buy it on sale. When they go to buy tuna fish in a store, they want to buy it on sale. But when they buy stock, they want to pay too much. <laughs> uh, you know, mercifully for me, after all this time, I, I, I try to buy my stocks like I buy my tuna fish, you know, and... Uh, 
Likewise. Last one I have here, Uranium uh, Royalty Corp. Uranium Royalty is the same thing. Uh, It it was selling at a tremendous premium to what it was worth. You you were basically paying for a while three times cash when they had no royalties. They've slowly deployed the cash at the same time that the share price has come down. Um, Very, very, very virtuous circumstance. There is still a fair bit of cash to deploy. uh, Well, cash and uranium. Uh, to deploy, uh, but it's become uh, reasonably priced the old-fashioned way. They both grew the company with a slow, careful deployment of cash, uh, and, and the price came down. It's important to note, too, that uh, Amir Adnani, uh, also the founder of Gold Royalty, ha- has done a very good job of investing in shareholder relations for 20 years. This asset doesn't show up on the balance sheet. It's an expenditure. But there's a cult of, say, 100,000 resource investors that own Amir Adnani stock, various stocks. There is nobody in the world who is, is as receptive to good news as an existing shareholder. And that 100,000 uh, shareholder cult established by Amir probably was established with a financial public relations cost over 20 years, exceeding $60, $70 million. It doesn't show up on the balance sheet, but it lowers his cost of capital. Uh, that's an important competitive advantage. Uh, Amir has done a very good job, too, of surrounding himself with a first-rate team uh, and spreading the general administrative charge associated with both financial public relations and this team across six or seven listed entities. Um, these are the types of attributes that don't seem to be talked about too much in research reports or blogs uh, or newsletters, but they're the type of thing that sophisticated investors have to consider when they're looking at the relative advantage company by company. If there's something that you can see that isn't expressed in the market, but will likely lower the cost of capital uh, in an ensuing market relative to a competitor, that is something that you have to consider in terms of your valuation and your investment decision. Yeah. You brought that up previously to me with a couple of different companies, um, that same instance. So just about the CEOs and founders, we asked that. So I'm going to see you in a couple of weeks in Boca Raton. I'd love, let's talk about that. And uh, what I really like about going to there is not only meeting you, but um, meeting all the speakers, listening to all of the speakers, and then just all the vendors that you have there, all the companies that are present. It's been, um, it's been eye-opening in all the good ways for me just to see the quality of people that you have there. So tell me about it. Uh, I'm told by my staff, uh, hopefully accurately, that between myself and Agora, who I used to manage that event for when they owned it, that we've been putting that event on for 28 years. We've tried to make it a little better every year. And if you make something a little better every year for 28 years, it ends up being pretty good. And I would suggest, not humbly, that ours is the single finest natural resource investment symposium on the planet. Why? Well, first of all, we have a core of attendees who goes back 28 years. The idea that all the knowledge on the, in the room ex- resides in the dais, and that knowledge is transferred to the audience is bullshit. Uh, We will have four or 500 uh, experienced wealthy investors trying to grow their wealth and preserve their wealth. So there's going to be an awful lot of wisdom in the room, not just on the dais. I would suggest that we have the best group of core attendees of any investment conference on the planet, the single best. You get that for free. What else do we have? We have great big picture gurus, people who tell you about the world the way it is, not the way that ABC and the Wall Street Journal and CBS and the CBC wish it was. Jim Rickard's talking about Wall Street uh, as the former chief counsel of long-term capital management, which damn near brought down Wall Street. Somebody who knows about the stresses, he created some of them, you know? Uh, Nomi Prinz, 
uh, talking about the structure of Wall Street, former partner at Goldman Sachs, former analyst. She's from the belly of the beast, you know? Daniela DiMartino Booth talking about the Fed because she was at the Fed. Grant Williams, uh, it's important to have your paradigm shaped in a way that allows you to question what you see on TV or what you read in the newspapers. We follow that by having really high quality portfolio managers and analysts, not flunky investment bankers who failed in technology and failed in consumer durables and have been put down in the gold space because they can't do any harm there, but rather people who over two or three decades have made money and resources where the rubber meets the road. People who I've observed for three decades there's probably a hundred people that want to speak at our conference every year and they're politely thanked and excused. Um, our exhibitors, uh, at every other uh, investment conference that I know of, the qualification to be an exhibitor is a pulse and a check that cashes in reverse order of importance. Uh, <laughs> at our conference, if you're a public company exhibitor, you have to be owned in accounts owned and managed by us. No guarantee, sadly, Andy, that if I own a stock, it goes up in price. But there is a guarantee that the vetting process is honest. I've written them a check as opposed to them writing me a check. If you're a bullion dealer or a coin dealer, uh, you have to have been in business for long enough that I know you. And I have to have received no customer complaints. Uh, that includes, you know, my 30 years with Global Resource Investments and then Sprott. No customer complaints from 15,000 clients over 30 years. It's a fairly tough bar. And uh, as a bullion dealer, you have to be a dealer that Battle Bank would be willing to extend a credit agreement to, to. Not that they'll necessarily accept it. The point is that every single exhibit there has been vetted. That's very important because our attendees for 28 years have told us that the exhibitors aren't just advertisers. They're content too. So that's what we've done. Then finally, uh, there's the living legends. And, and that's maybe my secret sauce. The living legends are a group of people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch, taken things from 5 million market capitalizations to $5 billion market capitalizations. You know, the guys who've had three zeros, okay? And, and what's great about this is that they teach us how they did it. They teach us the mistakes they made. Uh, they teach us really how to identify uh, a company in the $20 billion market cap range that could go to $2 billion. Uh, and I ask them on stage, tell me three companies that you own today that you don't run. In other words, employ your own discipline elsewhere in the market and tell me what you're doing. I had uh, an attendee uh, email me some years ago uh, about our conference saying that following Robert Friedland around the exhibit floor and following Ross Beatty around the exhibit floor and observing what exhibitors they stopped in front of and occasionally being able to lurk and listen to the uh, questions that uh, these living legends asked was worth the whole price of the conference, that they got the whole rest of the conference for free. Uh, another thing we've learned, uh, and by the way, you don't have to come to the conference live in Boca Raton. Uh, we will live stream the conference so that you can watch it in the comfort and convenience of your own home if you can't come to Boca. I think coming to Boca is better because there's nonverbal communication. But we had people from 30, 33 countries on live stream last year. Whether you attend in person or via live stream, we record the whole conference, including the breakout sessions. That's critical because we're going to give you 60 hours of programming in four days, more than you can possibly absorb. I put on the conference and I have to listen to the tapes. And it isn't just because of age and senility. Uh, we put out an awful lot of content. Because we do all this, uh, I can say, again, unlike any other investment conference that I'm aware of, whether you attend in person or whether you attend via live stream, if you don't feel that I've given you value for money, email me uh, and I'll give you a 100% refund. The financial risk around my conference is all 
mine. Absolute, unequivocal, money-back guarantee. Now, we've put on a good enough conference for 28 years, uh, and we've done boot camps and other financial education products. The quality has been high enough that over 28 years, I've had to refund less than one-tenth of 1% of the tuitions that I've charged. That notwithstanding, uh, somebody who isn't familiar with the quality of our products uh, perhaps should be reassured by the fact that I'm confident enough that there's a gold-plated money-back guarantee in place. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, and uh, I'm putting a link to anybody who wants to register in the show notes on both the podcast as well as the YouTube channel. I also want to shout out some of your staff who I've been dealing with, and they're absolutely amazing. You're a lucky man. Callie and Barb, if you could uh, make sure they, they hear thank you from me. They well, are that's great. Thank, thank you for that. They've all been with me in excess of 20 years. Yeah. Uh, but while I'm a fairly benevolent employer, believe me, if you don't deliver for my attendees, I thank and excuse you. Uh, Barb and Michelle, who physically put on the conference and have <laughs> for 20 yeah, years. Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Uh, and then, of course, Callie. Uh, I, I joke that she's my employee, but I write to her. Uh, <laughs> those women are really responsible in many, in many senses. And I should also mention Albert Liu, mm -hmm. who does the technical part of the conference and the technical part of rural investment media. That staff has been together for 20 years. Yeah. They work well together. They deliver. Uh, the staff is lean enough that we can bring the conference in at an affordable rate, uh, particularly relative to the quality of the product that we deliver. They're just superstars. They really are. And again, any question I have, they're on it. They get right back to me and they're very kind and very professional. So well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Rick, I will see you in Florida and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm delighted to host you there. Make sure that you sign up for the boat cruise before it's sold out. My wife and I have already signed up. We will be there. I mean, the boat cruise sells out every year. I, I'm beginning to think if I chartered an aircraft carrier, it would still sell. <laughs> uh, people every year complain about the fact they couldn't get on the boat cruise. And every year I say, well, you know, I mean, uh, I did everything but call your banker, right? <laughs> I know. I booked it. I booked it literally two months ago or as soon as right. I opened it. So we'll be there. So, all right. I look forward to it, Rick. Thank Have you. And I'll see you there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.